So, hello YouTube, it's Veteran Mountain Man again today, and today we're going to discuss the Constitution's third article, which I personally believe is the most important article that there is in the Constitution. And the big reason is, is it covers the judiciary, how the judiciary is established, and what the judiciary's responsibility truly is. And there's a lot of debate upon why a judge should do one thing over another, and we've got a lot of problem with activist judges instead of originalist judges being on the bench in this country. It's not about Democrat or Republican. It's not about libertarian or social justice warrior or alt-right. It should be a discussion about originalists versus activists when it comes to judges, especially on the Supreme Court. And I'm going to define those two terms for you. An originalist judge reads the Constitution, reads the legal statutes or state constitutions applicable in the case, reads the testimony, and then makes a decision based on the law itself. And if the law doesn't conflict with the constitutions, or the act, or the executive order doesn't violate the Constitution and the statute, then the law or the executive order is constitutional. Now, an activist judge takes it the other direction. They take their agenda into account, how they feel about what the action will occur, whether or not they feel that the law is just or not, whether they perceive that there might be some slight or inconvenience or inconsistency to some group, or it might upset or hurt some special group's feelings. Well, that's activism. And that has a time and a place, and I don't oppose it, because realistically, what I'm doing right now is a form of activism. But the time and place for activism is not on the judicial bench. The time and place for activism is outside of the courtroom and not in. We need judges that will uphold and maintain the laws as written, and uphold and maintain the founding documents and principles as written. So, in saying that, let's discuss Article 3 of the Constitution, the Judiciary Branch. So, in Article 3, Section 1, it states that there will be a Supreme Court and additional inferior courts as Congress decides, and that the judges of both the inferior and Supreme Courts will hold office as long as they are in good behavior and will receive a compensation as remunerated by Congress. Now, Section 2 gets into the laws. And it says, and this is a direct quote, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution, the laws of the states, and treaties made, or which shall be made under their authority. To all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and councils. To all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. To controversies to which the United States shall be a party to. To controversies between two or more states. Between a state and citizens of another state. Between citizens of, a different, of different states between citizens and the same state claiming lands under grants or different states, and between states or citizens thereof and foreign states, citizens or subjects. Now, that's the classification as to what the, the legal system is supposed to be ruling on. Now, it also mentions that uh, the Supreme Court will be the deciding court for ambassadorial law and shall be the appellate court for other courts. It also states that all crimes must be a trial by jury except for impeachment. All trials. So your ability to receive a jury trial instead of a summary judgment comes from the fact that that we have a third article of the Constitution. 
Now, it also states that trials must be placed in the state where the crime was committed. And this is why, even in situations like, say, the Boston bombing, they had to be tried in Massachusetts. Why? Because that is the law under the Constitution. Now, Section 3 covers treason. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them, or adhering to their enemies, and giving them aid and comfort. And no person can be convicted of treason without the testimony of two witnesses over an act, the same act, or a confession in open court. Now this is an important distinction here, because I've heard a lot of people push for treason trials. And one of the things I continue to state is that you cannot try someone for treason unless they've given aid or comfort to the enemy or worked with the enemy directly. And this is why. This, it, it's because of this section of the Constitution. This section dictates exactly what treason is. And so if you're going to look at someone and say that's treasonous, you need to look back at this definition because this definition is the legal definition in the United States of America for treason. And it's very important that we all use that same definition because tyranny can only be accepted if you allow them to change the definitions from what we've already agreed upon. Because the second you allow for a change in that definition, now the person who's allowed to change the definition has the controlling interest on what treason is. And so by changing it, you give them power outside of the Constitution, and you give them judiciary power that they were never given. So, if you want to talk about treason, you have to talk about it in the third article's context, or you're not truly talking about treason. Now, do I feel that individuals have committed heinous acts, uh, leaking information, leaking classified information, so on and so forth? Yes, yes, they have. Do I think that they should be tried for violations of security acts? Yes, yes, I do. Do I think some of them committed treason? I think there are some that could be cased for treason, such as Bradley Manning, who released military secured classified documents, which he knew would aid the enemy if they were read. I think people like Julian Assange, it really depends upon what the testimony from his leaked documents are. But do I think that WikiLeaks needs to be shut down and all members tried for treason for leaking the DNC emails? No. Because those DNC emails did not give aid and succor to our enemies. They just caused the Hillary Clinton campaign to fold. Now, do I think that they should be charged for maybe cyber crimes such as theft of data? Yes, yes. And if you can prove it, go for it. But I don't think that that constitutes treason or even election rigging. And so, unless you can back it up in law and quote chapter and verse, you can't jump to those conclusions. We have to take feels out of the law. Now, the last bit of Article 3 of uh, covers how Congress handles the punishment of treason. And this is also another key thing. Because in some countries, treason can be held through a bloodline. If your father was treasonous, you by definition are. Well, one of the things in our Constitution is a guarantee of independence from that. And it is exactly as I am going to read, and quote, Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attender of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attender. That basically means that you cannot be punished for your father being treasonous. Your father cannot be punished for you being treasonous. Your children cannot be punished for you being treasonous. You cannot be punished for your children being treasonous. And this is very important because in some countries, entire families under communism were rounded up 
and prosecuted for treason and sent to the gulags. And those gulags are where those families died because they were found treasonous. And it was part of the reason we had Russians coming to the United States in mass during Leninism and Stalinism and progressive Marxism in the USSR. And that bit of constitution was something that they lacked. It was a protection that the entirety of Russia lacked because they didn't have Article 3 like the United States did. So Article 3 is part of what makes America a unique social experiment. And you should protect and defend Article 3 by pushing for originalists. As I've said, originalists take the Constitution, take the state Constitution, take the actual processed law, and rule based off of the law and not their feelings. And originalist judges will continue to protect and guide America through its laws. And that doesn't mean that they have to agree with the law. That doesn't mean that they can't write a scathing opinion against a law. And that can be done, even by an originalist judge. But ruling and maintaining and protecting the Constitution means that you have to use the Constitution. You cannot do that through activism. Because activism throws all precedents, all law, all constitutional documents out the window and says, this is what I think is moral. And law cannot be necessarily about morality when it's being judged. It has to be about legality. Well, I want to thank you all again. Re please remember to like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this podcast. Also remember, I am over on minds.com forward slash veteran mountain man. In the description, I will leave a link to constitutionson.com, which allows you to view the Constitution in its original form, as well as all of its amendments digitally online. I will also have a link to the National Archives, which allows you to look at the original versions of the Constitution rescanned into digital format. I will also have a link to Amazon.com where you can purchase a copy of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and all pertaining amendments, as well as my link to mines. Thank you all, and have a good night.